I'm Richard Medhurst. Joining me is Sayed Mohammed Marendi, head of North American Studies at the University of Tehran. He's a great friend and a great friend of the show. Thank you for coming on, Professor. It's really a pleasure to have you on again. Thank you very much, Richard, for having me. So, uh, uh, Professor, you know, I, I wanted to, to start talking about the uh, elections, the presidential elections uh, in Iran. You know, um, one term that we hear a lot is this uh, hardliner in the media. Apparently, they, they don't like using the word principalist or conservative. They, they prefer to go with hardliner. What, what, I wanted to ask you, you know, what do they mean by that exactly? Is that just in regards to the United States, isn't it? Yes, exactly. They don't consider Iranians to be hardliners towards Argentina or Nicaragua or Venezuela or South Africa or India or Pakistan or China. It's just when Iranian leaders stand up to the United States and say no to appeasement. That's where they become hardliners. And even the term conservative is somewhat misleading because in Iran, those who are actually called conservatives, the, the, what they themselves call the principalists, uh, they are culturally speaking more conservative. But with regards to economics, they are left leaning. So it's very different from in Western countries, I think. In, in Iran, the reformists, the moderates are more culturally liberal, especially the reformists. But economically speaking, they're also more liberal and supportive of free markets and uh, capitalism and big business and that sort of thing. I'm glad you explained that because uh, I think it, it, it gets... Um construed a lot when it's uh, you know, spoken about in the Western media, and uh, people don't really understand the, the nuances. And uh, as, as, you know, speaking of the Western media, they, they've talked a little bit about the Iran nuclear deal, about the JCPOA, and saying that uh, you know, they've decri decried Trump pulling out of it, and not because he put crippling sanctions on Iran and ruined people's lives, but be apparently because this allegedly helped Raisi win, right? He won some 18 million votes. Um, and, you know, they're upset that this, this supposedly dashed any hopes of reforms. What do you make of this kind of language? To a degree, it's correct that the United States always fails those who put faith in it. It always fails them, no matter who they are and where they are. The Americans have a great tradition of betraying those who trust it. And in Iran, I'm not saying that the current administration, the outgoing administration, trusted the United States. But I think that uh, although some of them, some people like Dr. Zarif, I respect a great deal, but I believe that they were, to a degree, a bit too optimistic about U.S. intentions. And Iran has had a history with the United States where on every occasion that the Iranians actually agreed to sit down with them, they betrayed Iran. When in the 1980s, the Iranians agreed to help the Americans free Americans in, in Beirut that were being held by different groups, the Iranians had to go in and to you know, spend from their pocket, not necessarily financially, but credibility to get these people freed. And then afterwards, the Americans uh, behaved even worse to, towards Iran. After the war, uh, the Iranians gave, despite the fact that the Americans gave Saddam Hussein help, the Americans gave help and the Europeans gave him chemical weapons, the military intelligence to use it, as well as the political cover to get away with it. But the Iranians, in order to create a more favorable environment for rapprochement, they gave the Americans a, an oil field in the Persian Gulf. They gave it to Conoco. And after a couple of years of negotiations that the Americans were well aware of, they, when they were signing the agreement, the Americans imposed sanctions. Or in Afghanistan, when Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda and uh, the Taliban were you know, involved in 9-11, the Taliban wasn't involved, but they were in bed with Al-Qaeda in general, Al-Qaeda. Uh, the Iranians helped to overthrow these two groups, yet the Americans then immediately went and called Iran the, the axis, a part of the axis of evil. And the list goes on. So Iran has this history, and I myself was skeptical about U.S. ever 
implementing the nuclear deal. And I must add that the U.S. never did implement it. This is one of the myths that goes around is that Obama implemented the deal. He never did. The Iranians did, and Obama dragged his feet. And until the very end of his presidency, the Iranian central head of the Iranian central bank, who was a part of the uh, moderate or reformist administration of Mr. Rouhani, said that we can't do anything. So uh, Iran's mistrust of the United States goes back a long way, and it's based upon very clear evidence. And uh, I think that Mr. Raisi, when he says that we can't trust the United States, now people recognize that he was right. Yes. And uh, uh, I, I, I want to follow up with, with two questions here. You know, um, the, the Trump's assassination of uh, General Qasem Soleimani, uh, do you think this also contributed uh, in some fashion, as some people have suggested, to a Raisi win? And uh, as we were talking about the JCPOA, um, yeah, I mean, what, what is the strategy going forward? Because the, the sanctions are crippling, but, you know, the United States can't be trusted. So what do you think uh, we will see under that Raisi administration uh, in terms of the, the nuclear deal? Because the negotiations are were, happened right in the middle of... Uh, uh, what will happen at the same time they coincided with the elections, right? So it's kind of handing off to, from one administration to the next. Well, I don't know how the negotiations will end, and I don't know if we're going to have a deal or not. And I hope that the Americans come to their senses and uh, implement the nuclear deal in full as they should, uh, which they haven't done it in the past, as I pointed out, but... Uh, we hope they do, but uh, we have very good reason to be skeptical about uh, U.S. intentions. So I, I can't comment about the days and weeks ahead. But without a doubt, the, the murder of General Soleimani contributed to uh, Iranian animosity towards the United States, public animosity. We all saw the funerals, both in Iraq and Iran. There were millions of people in mid-sized cities, uh, and let alone Tehran, going to the funeral. And uh, I think that definitely contributes to people turning towards people, other people, candidates uh, who are, are deeply skeptical of the United States. And the same is true with the maximum pressure campaign. The fact that the Americans are committing crimes against humanity, against women and children in Iran, only serves to harden their position with regards to the United States. And it turns people who were previously more optimistic or at least hopeful uh, that the Americans would behave more reasonably more, uh, in a more humane uh, manner, it turns them against the United States as well. So if the Americans think that they can murder people and they can sanction women and children and people will love them, then um, that's the height of uh, naivete, I suppose. Yeah, right. And um, uh, what, what do you say to, uh, to people who look at the turnout? Um, I believe it was around 49%. And they say that, oh, this is, uh, this is extremely low. And it's, uh, I believe someone on Western media told you it was a failure of establishment. Or so they called it something ridiculous like that. What would you say to those people who, who, who criticize the low turnout? Well, we just had very important elections in France. And the turnout, I think, was in the mid-30s. And so is that a failure of the establishment? Does that mean that France is about to collapse or is going to fall apart? Is there going to be regime change? None of us take them seriously. But the, the problem is that they believe their own propaganda. It's very Orientalist. It's, you know, it's based upon a, a very long tradition that they have. And they believe these so-called experts, many of them, uh, you know, sort of natives, the, 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 the natives that, you know, as uh, these orientalized orientals or these brown sahibs, or as Malcolm X uh, would say, these house Negroes, you know, the, these are the people who mimic uh, their bosses in the United States. They say what needs to be said, but for in, in the case of Iran, for 42 years now, they've been saying that it's about to collapse, it's falling apart, people hate the regime, that's one of the words that they like using, regime. Whenever you hear regime in Iran, you can tell that that person or that 
news channel is completely subjective and 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 angry probably, but um, it's I I think it's I think by now it's pretty clear that forty nine percent is not great, but a there's a pandemic and according to polls that were carried out in Iran before the elections, uh, a roughly ten to twelve percent of Iranians said they're not going to vote because of the coronavirus. So if we add that, that makes that would make it like fifty eight percent, sixty percent, which is decent. Forty. 9% or 48.8%, I think is the accurate number, is not great, but it's, but it's enough. And uh, in the United States, the elections are usually in the low 50s, presidential elections. Uh, this time around, of course, because the fate of the United States was being determined, apparently, so said the two sides, uh, the turnout was in, in the mid-60s, but, but usually it's, it's lower. And uh, the 2000 and 18 elections and most probably the 2022 elections will probably be in, in the in the 30s. So there's nothing strange about the turnout in Iran. In fact, despite the pandemic, despite the maximum pressure campaign where people in Iran have really been put under a lot of pressure, um, and the fact that there's been day 24-hour day anti-Iran Iranian propaganda being uh, spread by BBC Persian, VOA Persian, Deutsche Welle Persian, Iran International, which is a Saudi channel, and a host of other TDP channels, in addition to an online army uh, that most of them are based in Albania, the MEK terrorist organization funded by the Americans and, and others. They, they too have been carrying out psychological warfare and all sorts of websites and and, and so on that are, uh, th there's more anti-Iranian material out there being beamed into the country, being sent into the country uh, by Western governments and their allies, than there is uh, counter uh, news and inf information being produced inside the country. That's how massive this campaign is. And one of the extraordinary things is that uh, Iran International, which is a Saudi channel, has these Iranian traders working for them. And they're calling for people to boycott the election and saying that it's undemocratic. The, you know, the audacity to use a Saudi platform to talk about freedom of democracy. It's, it's the ultimate hypocrisy. Yeah, the, the jokes really write themselves, don't they? It's, it's quite funny, honestly. It's really funny. Uh, but of course, they're a US ally and they're not a threat to Israel, so they get a pass. They are a friend of Israel. They're 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 friends of apartheid. I mean, it's it's extraordinary. Uh, but professor, I, I was hoping if uh, you could maybe expand on these attempts to subvert the election because the Americans they 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 throw a fit. Uh, they've been whining for years. Oh look, the Russians and and so on. Even the Iranians they blamed uh, uh, were trying to interfere in our elections. Uh, what have they been doing uh, in the West to subvert, um, and not just the West, but also, as we mentioned, you know, in Saudi Arabia, to in neighboring countries to subvert the Iranian elections? Uh, I, I think there's been quite a concerted effort there. No? Well, if you just listen to Biden a couple of days ago when he was criticizing uh, Pu President Putin, he was saying that, you know, uh, we uh, imagine we Americans in, you know, interfering in the elections of other countries. And you know, it was like, is this a joke? Is he joking? Is this right. deep fake or something? Well, the Americans have been trying to undermine Iran in every way or form possible, uh, whether it's through military threats, whether it's through sanctions, whether it's trying to, through trying to make people desperate. Let's go back and look at a, a very good example. And that is Nicaragua. After the Sandinistas overthrew the, uh, the, the, the regime that was controlled by the United States, what did the Americans do? They uh, used the Contra rebels. They created so much suffering in Nicaragua that the people, when there was another election, the people voted the pro for the pro-American candidate out of desperation, or at least the majority of the people. So, And then the New York Times went and said, they had like some sort of um, the, the the article said something like uh, you know American even handedness uh, pays its dividends or something like that. So they launch a dirty war and then they reap the benefits. In the case of Iran, 
they've done much more than what they did against Nicaragua in the 1980s. And that they've launched, you know, they support terrorists like the MEK that fought for Saddam Hussein and has been funded by the Europeans in the United States. They supported Saddam Hussein, they imposed sanctions. They've surrounded Iran with their military bases. They, con they constantly make threats against Iran. And they murdered uh, Iranian officials like General Soleimani, the person who basically defeated ISIS in our region. I mean, many other people were involved. Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, President Assad, Hezbollah, and, and others. But he was the, the, the leader of this whole operation, multinational operation, which saw volunteer fighters from Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iran and Iraq and Lebanon and Syria and elsewhere fight against these extremists. But he, he was, you know, he was the head of this war. And the, the extremists were, of course, created by the U.S. and its allies. And we don't need to get into that because I'm sure you've, dis you've explained this and discussed this extensively before. So, you know, it's, it's clear as day that the Americans are trying to make Iranians desperate. And then they use these Persian language media outlets to try to demoralize Iranians, to say you're the most miserable people on this planet. You know, when, when the coronavirus began, they were day and night try, trying to create this very dark environment. You know, as Boris Johnson was about to die because of the coronavirus, BBC English services were trying to, you know, keep things calm and keep, make, prevent people from, you know, getting too worried or, but BBC Persian was doing its best to say how, you know, horrific the situation in Iran is. So, so the, obje the objective, and, and another thing is that these Persian language TV channels are anti-Arab, they're racist, uh, they try to create division between Iranians and Arabs, just as many of these Arabic services are anti-Persian. I'm sure you've seen how the racism in, in them, but none of these TV channels are banned. None of them are condemned. Many of them are funded or owned by Western countries or countries allied to the United States. And uh, so, and then and on the other hand, Iranian TV channels, channels belonging to the resistance are all banned. You, can, you can't find them on satellite. You can't receive them in Europe or the United States, as you know, such as Press TV. I'm banned in, in the UK. Exactly. So uh, freedom of expression is, you know, is a one-way street. It's, it's, it's free as long as it's the Western establishment that's giving out the information. Otherwise, the rest of us have to remain silent and be polite and listen. Yeah, this this uh, it, it's really a one way street. I think you you put it very eloquently, and uh, I, I think uh, it's it's inherently arrogant. And I think uh, another another thing that I wanted to ask you about, which which I find also incredibly arrogant, is they always call our elections uh, illegitimate and undemocratic and and uh, uh, fraudulent, right? So in the United States, if you say that you're a crackpot, but if you come and say that about Iran or about Syria or Venezuela, this is accepted as fact, and you and you don't even need to provide evidence as journalists. Don't even need to provide evidence. You just say it. Um, you know, it's it, it's quite astonishing to me. And uh, you know, I think you were in Syria recently as well for, uh, during the uh, presidential elections. Could you maybe uh, tell us what you saw there, what the atmosphere was like, what you uh, um, uh, experienced firsthand? Well, I do not pretend to say that the elections in Syria were with multiple candidates and everyone had like an equal chance to become president. But look, Syria is a country that is under even more uh, severe pressure than Iran. A dirty war, a, a, a horrific dirty war has been waged against the Syrian people. Brutal sanctions have been imposed upon the people. The Americans are trying to starve the population. The objective is to starve Syrians, to bring them to their knees. That's what the Americans want, and the Europeans. They want to bring them to their knees. They want them to kneel. And that's why they've occupied the northeastern part of the country, stealing the oil, preventing Syrians from using their own oil, trying to prevent Iran from sending oil to Syria so that people could use the fuel to, to survive, to live, to work. They want to really bring them. They're, they're really brutal criminals, these Western regimes. So... President Assad led the fight 
in defeating these extremist groups, whether Al-Qaeda, whether ISIS, and you know that ISIS came from Al-Qaeda, and you know, as well as I, that Al-Qaeda was working with the United States. We know from Jake Sullivan's email in February 2012 to Hillary Clinton that he that he said openly to her that Al-Qaeda is on our side in Syria, literally a decade after 9-11. But in any case, so President Assad defeated all these extremists that were being supported by Erdogan, by Saudi Arabia, by Netanyahu, by NATO. NATO intelligence agencies across Europe were facilitating these radicalized young men and women to travel from European countries to Turkey, to uh, Syria and Iraq. We all know this. They all know this. Or your, your colleague, Serene Nishim, who, who I've met, who I met before. She was 29 years old and she was on the Turkish border with Syria on behalf of Press TV. And she said that uh, Turkish intelligence and ISIS were using World Food Organization trunks, that are, it's affiliated to the UN, to take in weapons and, and uh, ISIS fighters into Syria. And then, Turk, and then in another report, she said, Turkish intelligence has accused me of being a spy. I'm very worried. I'm just a reporter. I'm telling the truth. I've done nothing wrong. Hours later, she was dead in a mysterious car accident. Did any of those Western reporters based in uh, Istanbul say anything about it? None of them. Those who are, some of them are still based there, you know, from major newspapers, what major outlets, not a single one. She was Lebanese American. They didn't follow up on it. They knew what was happening, but they're all linked to the establishment. So Syria went through this horrific dirty war and sanctions. And the Syrian people, if they had not supported President Assad, there's no way Syria could have survived. I mean, first of all, Hezbollah and Iran went to their aid in 2013 militarily. I think Hezbollah's first operation was in April 2013. That was only after tens of thousands of foreign fighters had already come to Syria. So the whole of NATO and these regional dictatorships and the apartheid regime were all working together as the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012 points out and General Flynn in an interview on Al Jazeera of all places also pointed out that all these regimes work together to undermine Syria and to create a Salafist entity between Syria and Iraq. President Assad, if he didn't have the support of his people, there's no way he could have survived. There's no way Syria could have survived. So people in Syria during this election were giving him literally a vote of confidence. And I saw people vote. They were, it was, you, it was nothing you could hide. There was no show. They, I mean, I was just one person walking down the street on my own, looking at, you know, the celebrations afterwards, people, hundreds of thousands of people in each and every city gathering and, and celebrating it, it. Like, were they all doing it as a show for me? You know, they were just, they were celebrating. I, I couldn't sleep at night at 3, 3.30 a.m. because of all the noise on the streets because people were still celebrating. They were celebrating their victory and their victory was, uh, you know, was because of the resilience of the Syrian people. But President Assad was steadfast. He stood firm and he defeated these extremists. So people were thankful to him for prevent, from preventing their towns and cities and homes from being, being taken over by these monsters from Jaysh al-Islam and Ahrar al-Sham and uh, Al-Qaeda and, and Daesh and, and so on. Uh, it's, it, first of all, I mean, it's extremely tragic what happened to Serena Shim, Allah yarhamma. I mean, it's, it's really, um, it's daunting because, you know, 29, she's just a year older than me. Uh, and uh, the silence that from all these reporters in the region is deafening. Even though she's an American citizen, you see very quickly where their allegiances lie. Uh, it's it's uh, they, they don't even care about their fellow uh, countrymen. It's just towards uh, uh, their uh, their uh, corporate and uh, you know uh, uh, um, their corporate master and establishment. It's really it's really horrific and uh, it's heartbreaking uh, what happened to her. And you know I. Uh, 
I, I do think people in the West, they do not understand uh, what happened in Syria and what's still happening there. You know, my cousins, for example, have told me about the sanctions. Some of them have left uh, as, as refugees. Some of them are still there. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't need to tell you. I mean, there's just waiting in line for, for uh, days for fuel, waiting hours to get bread. And then people think that, uh, you know, this is... Uh, uh, Somehow it just it just fell out the sky because what has always struck me is when they report about the Iranian elections or Syrian elections They talk about the economic struggle, but they don't tell you it's because of sanctions the word sanctions is not there So they try to make it look like it's the government's fault um, Yes, and they say corruption It's as if the sanctions have no role to play and well if they have no role to play then why do you have the sanctions in the first place? so you know, they're, they're basically using this terminology saying like it's corruption and incompetence because they want to hide the fact that they're cr committing crimes against humanity. And these reporters want to feel better about themselves so they can, you know, by making this excuse. I mean, all countries have corruption. And in fact, when you have sac sanctions, corruption will increase because people, A, become impoverished, B, the normal means for trade and business through banks become impossible. So things have to go underground. And you, so the sanctions themselves create uh, uh, corruption, but the sanctions are brutal, inhumane, and they're a, a means of war against women and children. And the worst violators of human rights on this earth are Western regimes. There, there are no, there's no regime on this planet that does anything that can be compared to what these NATO regimes do. President Elect Raisi has been touted as very anti corruption. Um, he's the uh, head of the judiciary. And, uh, you know, th s someone asked him if he's ready to meet with uh, President Biden. <laughs> he said no, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I, I know how it's going to be interpreted in the West, but I wanted a more, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, a, a better explained answer from you, if, if you may. Uh, you know, what did you make of his uh, uh, his response? And also just were, were there any other re opening remarks from him that stood out to you, which, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of just stood out to you or surprised you? Well, why should he want to see Biden? Biden was the vice president of the Obama regime when they implemented these maximum pressure sanctions in the first place. It wasn't Trump who started this. It was Obama and Biden who were targeting women and children in Iran. And then when ultimately the United States was forced to accept Iran's right to enrichment and they signed the deal, the Americans still didn't abide by their commitments. They still tried to put pressure on women and children. Then, of course, Biden, when he, when he was criticizing uh, Trump, he said that he, you know, he, he disagrees with Trump's policy on Iran. But ever since he's been president, he's been continuing, t continuing the same policy. So he is targeting women and children. He's a murderer. Forget, you know, forget Syria, forget Yemen, forget Venezuela. Iran alone, these are crimes against humanity. But if you put Iran alongside all these other examples, it's, you know, it's just mind boggling. So why would he be interested in seeing such a monster? You, you know, uh... I wanted to ask you also just about the outgoing Rouhani government because you you said that they've um, they've grown unpopular um, and uh, that you know in some part it's it's not their fault because of sanctions because they've been dealt Trump which is I mean it, it, self explanatory uh, I don't think anyone can blame them for that and also um, the, the the pandemic but uh, I wanted to ask you what else do you think contributed to a loss in popularity and um, you, are there any things that you think they could have done differently perhaps. Yes, and as you po rightly point out, the pandemic and, and the maximum pressure campaign, they contributed a great deal. And so, you know, it wasn't something that they could control. Although I think their optimism about the United States was misguided, but, uh, or about Europe as, as well. The Europeans are the same as the Americans. They just use different terminology. But I think probably the biggest mistake other than that i mean that's not a mistake you know other than fate and the hand that they've been dealt as they say their own mistake i think was pursuing liberal liberal economic policies uh, 
you know, liberalism is not working in, in the West, despite the, the fact that this empire has been accumulating wealth for hundreds of years at the expense of the rest of the world to a large degree. Now we see how the middle class is collapsing in the United States and across Europe and how the situation is deteriorating. A country like Iran, which is under sanctions and which before the revolution really didn't have a great deal of infrastructure across the country. Most of what we see in Iran uh, came after the revolution, the infrastructure in small cities and towns and villages and in the poor neighborhoods. You don't see the sort of poverty in Tehran that you see in Paris or other, you know, or many similar European cities. They don't exist in Tehran. You won't, you won't find that. But, but in any case, uh, when you're under sanctions, when you're under pressure, when you have a pandemic, and when there's a global economic crisis, uh, liberal economic policies are definitely not going to work when they don't work in Western societies which don't have sanctions and they have a, you know, they've accumu accumulated wealth for hundreds of years, as I said. So, and personally, I think liberal economics and Mark, uh, I'm not a communist, I'm not, uh, I, but I, I don't believe in capitalism. And uh, I think that their, uh, their, their belief in, in liberalism and uh, market forces uh, have led to a, a huge gap between rich and poor, which we haven't seen since the revolution. And uh, since the revolution was about social justice and fairness, uh, many people became uh, disillusioned. And one reason why many people didn't bother to vote was because they were so upset with what they were seeing. And uh, Mr. Racy, he has been advocating social justice, fighting against corruption, and corruption is something that we've seen increase over the past decade. And, and more than a decade, but especially in this administration. Not that the administration is corrupt, but it has not been as careful as it should with regards to corruption uh, in the system. So um, I think that a lot of people are pinning their hopes that Racy, that uh, President-elect Racy, will turn things around. It will be difficult, but uh, I think the right policies are to for the government to look after those who've been left behind, to uh, strengthen the uh, social uh, welfare net. And uh, the priority is, is for the, those who are less fortunate financially. They are the majority of the country. They have as many rights as, as anyone else. And uh, anything other than that, I think is immoral and uh, unacceptable. Uh, what do you think will be the most striking differences um, in domestic policy and equally in foreign policy between Raisi's government and uh, Rouhani? Well, my hope is that uh, President-elect Raisi, I'm not saying that Rouhani was a, a liberal and that nothing was done for the, you know, I'm just saying that, you know, the focus should have been more on those issues. And my hope is, and I, my expectation from what, uh, President-elect Raisi has been saying is that he will move in this direction and he will turn things around. Uh, but I also think that his, his objective is to uh, support lo local production, whether the private sector or the public, uh, to decrease imports and to be more self-reliant, both economically uh, and as well as in the agricultural sector. But also, I think with regards to foreign policy, I think he's going to tilt uh, to the local, to the global south, to the east, East Asia, Central Asia, Russia, China, Latin America, especially with the fact that you know many there are new rising powers. China is a rising power. It is it is it is extremely important today. So uh, when the Americans and the Europeans slam the door, then they shouldn't expect uh, Iran or anyone else to just sit behind the door and wait for them to open it. I think that's a, another mistake that the current administration or the outgoing administration made, not that the foreign minister or the foreign ministry made, I mean the, the government in general, is that they were pinning too much hope on uh, the US implementing the deal. I think 
uh, the, the incoming administration, hopefully, this is my hope, uh, that they will say, okay, you know, if you are willing to implement the deal, fine, we'll implement our side of the bargain, but we're not going to wait for you anymore. We're going to find new friends. We're going to uh, strengthen our ties with other countries so that we need you less and so that in future, you will have fewer cards to hold uh, when you want to pressure us. And the fact that the Americans are also putting pressure on the Russians and the Chinese and sanctioning them and antagonizing them and so on actually creates an incentive among these countries, all of these countries, to work closer with each other to uh, stand up against American aggression and uh, hegemony. So you think we're going to see more of a tilt to uh, the, the, the East, so to speak? Uh, you know, we saw this 25-year strategic partnership uh, signed between Iran and China. And uh, do you think they're going to uh, go beyond that and, and uh, move away from the West uh, uh, completely on all fronts? I think that Iran is going to become global. Not that Iran doesn't want to have anything to do with West, Western countries. It's Western countries that are imposing sanctions on Iran. It's Western countries that are targeting women and children. If they behave like normal human beings, then the relationship would evolve very quickly. Uh, it has nothing to do with anything but, uh, but you know, the, the arrogance of, of empire. So whether it's the East or the global South, it doesn't make a difference. If anywhere where Iran can find friends, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in Argentina or Venezuela or Bolivia or Cuba, or whether it's in South Africa or Nigeria or Algeria, or whether it's in Pakistan, Bangladesh, in India or in Central Asia, it doesn't make a difference. Iran will be exploring new relationships a, because it's the right thing to do anyway. B, because in the world that we're living in, there are new powers are on the rise and Iran should explore the new opportunities that exist. And, and C, countries, why shouldn't Iran cooperate with countries that want to do business with Iran, whereas other countries like the Europeans and the Americans are antagonistic towards Iranian women and children? Yeah, they're, they're not really interested in business. They want to steal, which is, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what they, they've uh, been trying to do in Iran uh, and the Middle East for centuries. And what so, they've done know, in and, Venezuela, and done. what they're doing yeah. is stealing Venezuelan gold, stealing Venezuelan assets, trying to make the Venezuelans poor and impoverished. It, it's, you know, it's staggering what they have done to the world. And it's, and it's, you know, the audacity of these Western elites and reporters speaking as if they give, you know, if they, you know, they care about human rights or democracy and freedom. It's just, it's just a joke. They're just, it's not a joke. It's, 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 it's shameless. It's shameless rhetoric. Well, why, why do you think it is that every time they, they talk about ele uh, our elections in Iran, in Syria, that they bring up human rights uh, and they bring up, uh, uh, economic misery without saying that it's uh, sanctions causing it. They bring up corruption without saying that they're responsible for increasing it. But why do you think that, that they do this? Uh, what, what's the long-term goal here, you know? Yeah, part of it is, is propaganda. I mean, it's just clear propaganda. It's these media outlets. You know, I've, I've, had, I've had a lot of experience with reporters. And often, I'm not saying they're all bad, but often you speak to mainstream reporters and in private, they'll say, yeah, I agree. And that's right. And even when it comes to ISIS and Al-Qaeda, but are they going to reflect that in their reporting? Very, very rarely do you see that happen. Very rarely do you see that happen. A, they can't. You've seen people who retweet something and they get into trouble. You see this young Jewish woman in, working for AP getting kicked out of AP literally days after the AP offices were brought down in Gaza. So, you know, this is the state of affairs that you simply can't say much. And also, I think there's a, another, a more personal level to it. These people, I think many of them have to feel, they have to feel, they, can, they have to be able to sleep at night. So when they're reporting, you know, when they're 
producing anti-Syrian, anti-Iranian, anti-Venezuelan, anti-Yemen, uh, propaganda, anti-Palestinian, anti-Palestinian, anti-Cuban uh, propaganda, they have to sort of feel human. So they say they, they, they project evil on, on the victims. They turn the victims into uh, guilty entities to make this crime look not only less uh, ugly to their own populations, but I think for their, own, for their own sake as well. So in the case of Iran, I'm not saying Iranian elections are ideal. And I have my own criticisms of the, this particular election. But first of all, I have no doubt that Mr. Raisi would have won anyway, even if there was one major candidate who was uh, not allowed to run. And that was Dr. Larija. And I was very surprised. But he wouldn't have won anyway because he is associated with the outgoing administration. I don't believe he is really associated with them. I think he has very differing views. But that is the public perception. And the, the reformists and the moderates are despised right now in Iran for whatever reason. As I said, part of it is not their own doing. It's Trump and, and the coronavirus and, and, and the Europeans and, and all that. But Mr. AEC would have won, but you know, even if even though the, deba the debates, I mean the, the election, you could say uh, was flawed, the debates were very hard hitting. They were very different views. The reformist, the main moderate or reformist candidate, the former head of the central bank, who was just recently removed, he was very hard hitting. He, he is a well-known figure. The head of the central bank in this country is not a, a, you know, a lightweight. Uh, he, hit, he and his, uh, the, uh, the other reformist candidate hit uh, Mr. Racy very hard. Uh, to, to his credit, Mr. Racy was very moderate, but uh, some of the other candidates hit, hit those reformists hard. You, you have this on Iranian public t television, these debates. Whereas in the United States, you have Biden and Trump. You don't have a third party candidate. Then you, you have two people standing up there debating, or you had Clinton and Trump. So if, you know, if, if they want to be democratic, let the third party candidate be a part of the debate. Again, I'm not saying Iran is ideal. I'm not saying Iran is a utopia, but I'm saying that you know, they're, they're intentionally ignoring the fact that there is open debate in this country there are real elections in this country. On the one hand, they say that the president has no power. Yet when someone who they don't like becomes president, they say he's a threat to the world. I mean, how can it, how can they, you know, this, this is a paradox. How can he have no power? It's, it's like Iran, in fact. On the one hand, they say the regime is falling apart. The regime is corrupt. Everyone hates the regime. It's incompetent. It's, and then it's, a, it's at simultaneously, it's an emer it's a rising threat to the world. If it's falling apart, how can it be a rising threat? So you have all these inconsistent uh, arguments, but since you know it's all negative, and of course Iran is evil, just like these other non-Western countries, it's all believable, even though they're inconsistent. Because you say, oh yeah, well, it's they're incompetent. Yeah, of course, they're you know they're corrupt. Yeah, sounds right. They're also dangerous. Sounds right. But you know, you, when you put them together, it doesn't make sense. But you know, that's how Western narratives work. Yeah, and, and you know, one thing that I that I find astonishing is that uh, they they keep asking uh, if this is going to change anything vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli occupation. Um, you know, I, I don't think they seem to understand that I Iran uh, is guided by principles. Uh, in terms of supporting the axis of resistance, supporting the liberation of Palestine. So they think that because you have a new Israeli prime minister, Naftali Bennett, in charge of that occupation, and you have a new Iranian president, that something new is going to come about. <laughs> yeah, and Bennett, who, who said, I've killed many Arabs, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I've, there's no problem with that. So, you know, he can say that sort of thing. But, you know, the, in, the, the interesting thing is that yeah, Iran, how could, you know, if you say Iran has principles, they'd say, come on, these, these mullahs, you know, that's another term, as if, you know, everyone in, in Tehran and all the people in power, they're all wearing turbans. But uh, so uh, these, the Iranians, they have no principles. Yet uh, the bad thing about the, the theocracy, whatever that means, 
uh, is that it's all these rules and regulations and, you know, people's lives and freedoms are, are limited. Well, you know, even if, if they're wrong, that means they have certain principles, right? F flawed principles, evil principles, whatever they are. Yet, those, ba those are bad principles. But when it comes to Israel, how can they have principles? It's all for show. It's all hypocrisy. It's all, you know, again, all of their arguments are flawed and inconsistent. But the, the, uh, the reason why I believe that they are um, believable is because of Orientalism. Because, uh, you know, in Orientalist discourse, you have this latent knowledge that is negative. So when it when the information that you're fed is negative, it sounds right, even though it they're not logically consistent. And the uh, second level is that these people say it because again they have to live with themselves. When they are supporting, when these reporters who are in Israel, when they're in occupied Palestine, uh, reporting, they know that this is an apartheid regime. They know that ethnic cleansing is being carried out. They know that Palestinians are being killed every day. They know that Palestinians are being treated like animals, but they have to justify their silence. So the only way that they can justify their silence is to take away uh, the moral superiority away from the victim. You know, they, they turn it into a, it's like someone, I don't know if I can say it, here, but it's like some man raping a woman and battering her. And then, you know, they say, well, he said, and she said, you know, what does that mean? Uh, a, a horrific crime is being, well, you can't say he said, she said, but this is how, this, this is how they, you know, they, they, they prevent themselves from getting into trouble and how they also help the establishment frame the argument by you know turning what is a blatant a blatant war crime into he said she said yeah yeah they they uh, love simplifying things to suit their narrative and uh, it, it's uh, it's really painful to, to, to... it's very pain every day you you look and you see another Palestinian kid has been killed and and forgotten and then you know tomorrow it's just going to be another kid and the day after tomorrow. And then you have these Western reporters, EU uh, embassies, Western embassies in Israel, all of them very pleased with, you know, their great friendship uh, with the apartheid regime. And remember, this is, but this is not going to last. They think it's going to last. But uh, remember apartheid South Africa, the same thing happened. At, in, my friends who were you know South Africans who were fighting apartheid? Some of them would have would tell me that we we thought this would we you know we would never see liberation, and it happened. So and Western countries were supporting the apartheid regime, even after Nelson Mandela was freed from prison. He would continue to be considered an, a terrorist according to U.S. law. He became president. He was still a terrorist according to U.S. law. His presidency ended. He was still a terrorist, according to U.S. law. In 2009, years after he retired, he was finally removed from the list of terrorists and, and the ANC, of course, by the United States. That, that is how Western countries function. And the same is true with Israel. Israel will ultimately crumble uh, because these inconsistencies and the the brutality uh, and the the sheer ugliness of uh, apartheid will will not be able to sustain itself. You know, you me you mentioned the year two thousand nine, and I, I just want to rewind a bit here because what I remember from two thousand nine in Iran is that they were meddling in the uh, elections on Twitter, and I find this so funny that you know uh, they they put labels now on uh, Iranian uh, state media, Russian state media, and and try to. Uh, scare people away from anti-imperialist news, and they claim that uh, Russia and Iran and China are interfering in their elections, but they were doing this a decade ago um, online in the exact same manner with bots as they claim and all this stuff, and, and they were using this also as a vehicle for, uh, you know, revolts in, 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 in the Arab Spring. So, you, you know, it's, it's I, I just, I can't get, 
I, I really hope that people wait, uh, could, could, uh, could understand that um, uh, the same thing goes on and, and, and li truly goes on. Like, this is something that they actually do to us. Uh, but uh, it's just not covered, um, you know. And, and uh, you know, I, I I wanted to ask you if, if there's um, if there's one thing because you know the most of my viewers are Americans, so most of them are Westerners. If there's one thing that you would like to like them to know about the elections that just took place, what would it be? What was it? What would you like them to take away? Because I think they're not going to get any of this anywhere else. Well, in two thousand and nine, not only were they weaponizing. Uh, you know, Twitter or, and Facebook and the algorithms, I don't even want to get into that. But they were, they had television stations, they were funding television stations, both state owned and private owned, uh, but funded by the state in Persian, constantly uh, carrying out psychological warfare. They were funding NGOs in Iran. And the whole allegation of, of, um, of fraud in elections was baseless, just like Bolivia, the exact same thing, the exact same thing. They said there was fraud in Bolivia. They, they overthrew the government. Western media was very happy about it. They justified it, and it turned out it was a lie. In Iran, they, they couldn't undermine the state. The state was, was too smart for them. And I, I debated people on television on, you know, Western media outlets, many of these people were making these ac accusations. They had no argument. It was just hearsay and nonsense. But they were carrying out psychological warfare to undermine the country, just like what they do in Iraq. In Iraq, the Americans have over 2,000 NGOs. That what, did, what are these NGOs for? They, they pay people to act as their thugs on, you know, on the streets, attacking the Iranian embassy or whoever it is they don't like. The same is true elsewhere. They fund people to undermine governments that they don't like. So, uh, four, so four years ago, we had Russiagate in the United States. We've never had evidence that the Russians really did anything. And I, there's, there's nothing there. And if, and if the Russians could really so easily bring Trump to power, then the United States is not a superpower. They should just, you know, stand down and let someone else take over. But the, the, uh, let's assume that Russiagate was true. The outrage that was brought about in the United States by the Democrats and their supporters was, you know, was, you know, was it was four years of crisis. So how is it that the United? It's not legitimate. It's not acceptable for other countries to interfere in U.S. elections. Yet the United States and the Europeans, because the Europeans do the exact same thing. They're just as dirty. They're just as dirty in Lebanon, everywhere. The Americans and the Europeans and, you know, Australia and their, their allies, they can do the same thing, not just to one country, two countries across the world. And as I said, the, the example of Bol Bolivia is a great example that how they brought down the government, how the Western media celebrated and how it came out that uh, this was all a lie, and how the people of Bolivia, through their resistance, forced the regime to, to have elections, and where they won the elections just like they'd won fair and square in the first place. Yeah, because I, you know, I really want to drive this point home, because when you see Biden uh, acting like the U.S. has never interfered anywhere, this goes over people's heads. They really believe this, so we have to do our part to, to counter that with the truth. And, um, you, you know, Professor, uh, I've seen you go on so many networks uh, uh, to talk about the elections, BBC, Al Jazeera, RT, you know, which is also why I'm so grateful for you taking the time to come on. But I wanted to ask you, what's, what's, perhaps, <laughs> what's perhaps one of those stupidest uh, questions that they ask you or the, something uh, that they all repeat that, that you know, get, uh, is, is just uh, outrageous? And it's probably a lot. One thing that I find quite humorous is when they try to frame the narrative. Often when they add information after the interview is done, or they say something before I actually can hear what's being said. So for example, uh, I don't, uh, you, know, uh, you know, or for example, someone does an interview with me and then they say like, professor so-and-so, 
who is close to the regime. Or, you know, we're going to have someone who's close to the regime. So automatically they discredit you. They don't, when, when they speak to some American academic uh, at, you know, Harvard or Yale or UCLA or Northwestern or wherever, or in England, they're not going to say, you know, close uh, to the Biden regime or the Trump regime or the, they're going to say, you know, Professor so-and-so says this. But if it's, if it's someone like me who says something that, you know, runs against their, their narrative, it's this guy close to the regime. And I don't even know what it means, close to the regime. Like, am I being paid? Am I sitting in the president's office? You called me and like, uh, you know, I'm at home or like I'm in, I'm a, in my office on campus. Like, you know, where does that come from? So that's, that's how it's sort of, like, again, it's like the, the Palestinian thing. It's here, you know, where they try to frame it as he, when it looks really bad, they try to make it he, uh, you know, he says, she says. And, uh, or uh, when the argument is not going well, you know, close to the regime, you know, a regime is just like some menacing monster and I'm, I'm like working for the Godfather and I'm sitting beside the Godfather, kissing his ring and, you know, coming on television and the mouth of Sauron or whatever. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. No, really, it, it, it's really funny. And I, I can just imagine how, how uh, um, I mean, I'm, I've, I've watched, you know, almost all of the interviews you've done in the last few days. I've thoroughly enjoyed watching you go on and school people. So, you know, this was really, re it's really invigorating to see that. But at the same time, I was certain that, you know, at one point, it, they, their ignorance must, must also take a toll because it's too much. Uh, Professor Marandi, thank you so much uh, for your time. Just before I let you go, where can people find uh, your work? Where can they follow you online and find more of your uh, interviews and, uh, and, and uh, works? Well, Facebook has disabled my account and so has Instagram. So at the moment, I'm left with uh, a Twitter account for the time being. So they can follow me on Twitter if they're interested. I don't have much I'm not as active as you are, and I don't have as much to say as you do, but um, I do have a Twitter account. Well, thank you so much. I'm grateful for being invited. Thank you very much. And you're doing a great job and keep up the good work. Thank you, sir.